Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Padraig Kenny. I'm the director of the Collins Living Learning Center. Um, and I just want to say this is pretty fantastically incredible. You never know who's going to come out for something. But now I know what the secret is to get 40 people to come out on, a, uh, on an evening. So thank you for that. I've been looking around at these portraits and thinking, all right. <laughs> But several of them were undoubtedly queer, so it's probably just fine. <laughs> <laughs> you figure out who. Um, so anyway, um, so tonight's uh, event, Being Queer in Putin's Russia, is going to be a really interesting event, a dialogue between uh, two people who can have a really interesting conversation about the topic. Um, see if I can do my lefts and rights correctly. Oh, well, oh, sorry. he's moved. <laughs> Just kidding. For Facebook. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> to my right and behind me is uh, Steve Sanders, professor of law. He is an IU grad um, and a U of M law grad. Before coming to IU, he taught at uh, Chicago and Michigan before realizing he really needed to be here instead. Um, he is both in both the courtroom and in the classroom. He's been active on constitutional issues, in particular issues um, surrounding LGBTQ rights, trans, transgender rights, and uh, so on. I should mention he is also a, um, uh, an affiliate with the Departments of Political Science, Gender Studies, and the Kinsey Institute. To my left is Alexei Lyosha Gorshkov, uh, who um, received his PhD in political science from Perm State University, that's in Siberia, if you've not visited it or were not quite sure where to find it. Um, after uh, getting his PhD, he taught at uh, Perm, Universe, Perm State University for a number of years where he created a really, uh, well, if not quite unique, at least pretty close to unique in Russia, certainly path-breaking, curriculum in gender studies and LGBTQ studies uh, within uh, political science. Um, and it's partly for that reason that he had to leave the country. I should say that you will hear a bit about that story, but if you afterwards you think, I really just want to know more, um, I do want to recommend the uh, prize-winning book by Masha Gessen, The Future is History, uh, which is about Putin's Russia. And the reason you'll want to read it is because you'll say, oh my god, I know somebody in this famous book. Because the uh, Masha Gessen's concept is that she follows four people born in the 1980s in Russia as they deal with the transformation first into democracy and then into the authoritarian country that it is today. And one of the people she chose to follow through that book is Lyosha. This is no secret. His name is in the book. He's not anonymized or something. But I highly recommend it. It's a really good read. And you'll feel like you already know part of the story after today. So since uh, 2015, he has been living in New York, in Brooklyn, where he has been active in the RUSA LGBT uh, association. association. Thank you very much. Um, and been really active in kind of energizing the very traditional uh, Russian uh, emigre community there, and uh, they've never seen anything like um, Brighton Beach uh, pride uh, until Yosha came along. Um, and so he's really done some transformative things in that community. Um, and he leaves us tomorrow to go on to his new job as director of the Gender studies or LGBT? LGBT Center and Women's Center. And Women's Center, okay, so I had that sort of right, at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. But he's still ours for right now, so please join me in welcoming Steve Sanders on Joseph Burke. Let me add my thanks to you for coming out. Um, I think, we'll, you know, uh, Leosh and I will talk for um, about 45 minutes and then uh, open it up to your, to your questions for him as well. Um, and, and thank you, Padraig, for the introduction. I'm, uh, I, I am an IU graduate. I was a journalism student, and I've always uh, felt like a sort of frustrated journalist at heart, even though I now teach law, so I really like opportunities to, to just engage in dialogue with someone and try to bring out you know, what's interesting in such an interesting person. So, um, Yosha, let me start um, with what uh, Padraig uh, discussed. You, you are a PhD, you're a political scientist, uh, educated in Russia, um, your work focused on gays and lesbians, but um, 
you were forced to leave, essentially. I think you said in an online interview, I was forced to leave because I was a gay professor. So fill in what, what were the circumstances that caused you now to live essentially in exile mm -hmm. in the United States? Yes, it's, you know, I've been telling that story so many times and I always try to change that, but there is nothing to change because the same remains the same. But it was 2013, if you're familiar with the Russian context and queer context, uh, in June 2013 the government and forced the Duma, the parliament, to uh, implement the local propaganda of non-traditional values, which by default means propaganda of LGBTIQ as a part of the foreign agent policies. So, and uh, basically it was to protect minors from all undesirable information. So if you talk with kindergarten people, whatever, with schoolers about uh, LGBTIQ, you will be fined. But the question is, so we never served minors. I was working always with the college uh, students and the problem is that the law was designed to suppress the opposition, to suppress the people who do not support the Putin's government. And basically, first people who were openly gay, lesbians, or criticizing government were uh, in the death row. And uh, in October 2013, I became deputy dean for student affairs, and that I got a call from Federal Security Services, which used to be KGB, if you're familiar with the Soviet history, it's a secret police, and now it's Federal Security Service, so, and eventually, we had a beautiful conversation in his room when he tried to recruit me to report on people who are, and he, his words, who are nationalists, communists, and homosexualists. So basically, FSB, Federal Security Service, always knew about myself, because I got my PhD in 2009, 10 years ago, and they always were following us, like ideological enemies. But when they got this tool, uh, we started getting a lot of uh, interesting uh, background. And uh, after that conversation, because I played fool, I said I could not interfere with the students' private life and faculty private life. So I was pretending I didn't know anything. But my apartment was under watch and the surveillance. I got a lot of death threats. And eventually, I had to move from my apartment to the apartment of my friend, which was secured. Uh, in a very secret facility and uh, I was driven by his private driver to my job for a couple of months but the critical point was uh, March 2014 when the article came out and our head of the university got that article which is called Propaganda of Sodomy at Perm State University which was demanded to fire us. So and that's been a lot, I'm just briefly discussing mm -hmm. of course but there was so much layers to that and you realize that there is not, nothing and I was, I was involved with the secret underground LGBTIQ group in Perm, in Perm uh, region, in Perm Krai, which was uh, under surveillance as well. So there was a lot of things, and my students would report on us, on me, and we had a center for gender studies I was a part of. So it's a lot of things. So you were teaching LGBT politics, so, basically yes. something I have done. There are courses at this university yes. about that. There's a gender studies department, but in the eyes of, we don't the, have of in the eyes of the government, that was propaganda about sodomy. Yeah, but we didn't have a department mm -hmm. of gender studies. So when I came along, I just created queer studies because we had gender classes about women's and history. Who didn't know about Catherine the Great? So that's why I said it's not the queer theory. And they let me, so university let me, because the university is not in Moscow, not St. Petersburg. It's very liberal at that point. And of course, we had a lot of things going on which did not please the government, mm -hmm. did not please the ideological police. And because I was open at the same time, there's, you cannot find any open queer person in any levels of educational system in Russia. Never, ever, especially uh, if you are from the university level. Mm -hmm. So, and that's attached to that, there was a huge case against me. Mm -hmm. And I knew from 2012 that Federal Security Service even knew about my private affairs and private life because I had a student who told me and her father was a colonel at Federal Security Service. I was going to ask, did you find an enthusiastic group of students who probably thought you were a breath of fresh air? Of course, but that's another story. So here you have all of these LGBT centers and programs. Nothing like that exists in Russia. And that's why students who even 
uh, consider themselves uh, LGBT, they never would reveal that. And that's why it was a struggle for me, because I taught uh, it too different colleges in order to survive in Russia, professors do, do not make much. So I had seven jobs at the same time, even being with deputy dean. And uh, students, of course, and most who were supportive towards were straight students. Mm -hmm. So which is not surprising at all because people do not want to associate with. Yeah. But sometimes I will receive some private messages from my students. Here probably you will be already kicked out of the university if you communicate with the student via social media on some private level but they didn't have any place to go mm -hmm. to turn to and that's why they reached me with different uh, social media and you have to understand that all social media in Russia controlled by federal security here we have Zuckerberg but there we have <laughs> federal security <laughs> service so which is absolutely under control and we knew and we that's why we had to even the closed page of our Center for Gender Studies mm -hmm. because it was a unique center mm -hmm. not very much across the country. So there are so many things and of course all of this police involvement and at that time it was already occupied pedophilia, operating the movement which uh, got a couple of my acquaintances who taught for college and they were trapped by this absolutely brutal uh, group of people uh, who chase gay, uh, it's called safari or gay hunting. Mm -hmm. So they blackmail them, they send the whole tapes to the workforce, to the directors of the colleges, and after that they force them to leave. So there were so many things I could not even so imagine. Were you, were you literally ordered to leave the country, or basically things just got so bad that you had no choice but to leave? Things got very, and so I always knew, I never was very enthusiastic about Russian spirit and Russian soul. I always knew the history, mm -hmm. and history teaches us who wants to study history of Russia, that Russia is a pendulum of development. So we always have the same circulation, circulation of events. And by 2011, it was already clear to me when pedophilia law was passed that it will be a crackdown on LGBTIQ. So I already knew, but I, with my, uh, at that time I was younger and I was like more naive in terms of no, we can change, we can change. But when people started getting arrested, when people started getting killed without any investigation, further investigation, I realized, and after that article which came out, I realized there is no cho chance for me, even though I resign, even though I uh, get out of the university, where I go to. I don't have any place to go, I will be on the radar. Mm -hmm. And that's another story, I had to keep myself, uh, I had to keep quiet because I could not tell anyone that I had to leave. Mm -hmm. Because the federal security is all this, the big brother watches you. So if you ever read 1984, it's exactly what's going on in Russia. It's exactly what's going on in Russia. Mm -hmm. So the walls have ears. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, I knew and I couldn't say, and I had to stay until my vacation starts. Mm -hmm. And when my, my vacation starts, I left right away mm -hmm. because otherwise they will not let me out of the country. Yeah. It was so uh, under uh, pressure. But you never, that's another story with us. So in Russia, you have to get up and move forward. You cannot be depressed. You cannot sit and cry over your faith. You have to do something. So where were, where were you born? What was your childhood like? I'm, I'm assuming you left behind parents, siblings, mm -hmm. relatives in doing this? Yes, so I was born in a very small town, not like Bloomington, even smaller in, in, text, in the context of Russia, but uh, it's a kind of rural north side called Salikamsk. It's a literally abandoned place with the coal mines, not, even not mineral mines. And we ended up there in the 30s because my great-grandparents were uh, persecuted by Stalin, we were Germans, mm -hmm. and at that time uh, Stalin uh, conducted a lot of purges and all Germans who lived in the south of Russia, in Volga region, were forced to leave, uh, not even to leave. They were put in the cattle cars and sent in exile to uh, Ural. So that's how my great-grandparents ended up there. So, and I was born in that uh, district of uh, absolutely nowhere. So because railroads stopped there. Mm -hmm. There is no other way, it's forest, 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 and a lot of prisons. Because Perm Cry was considered one of the exile places for political dissidents, for prisoners. And uh, in my hometown, there is one of three life sentence prisons, which called White Swan. We love beautiful names for our penitentiary system. <laughs> so, and that's all surrounded by 
uh, inmates, the culture itself, but the, the town, it's old one, it's like a 600 years. It had had at some uh, point very significant role in the Russian mm -hmm. history because it was a salt production. Mm -hmm. But I was born there and I was born right after Gorbachev took power in 1985 and I'm a child of Perestroika. So, and that was significant, I guess, it determined my uh, development is in political uh, terms and terms of liberal, liberal arts. And my mom is a historian. She's a history school teacher. I was a principal, very tough one, like communist, like very. <laughs> but uh, it was very tough childhood because we, I grew up in the 80s and 90s with, with no internet, no understanding what uh, is going on with me uh, identity-wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, imagine you live in the town of inmates and prison culture with all of those attitudes and when you start uh, feeling something mm -hmm. sexually you cannot understand what's going on mm -hmm. with you so you blame yourself and you think you're sick mm -hmm. you're diseased yeah. and nobody I never knew probably I knew but I never befriended with any LGBTQ people yeah. being in that small town I watched um a, a movie that you hosted a screening of called mm -hmm. Campaign of Hate, mm -hmm. which is about life and gay life in Putin's Russia. And, and one of the characters on that said they, um, kind of in a situation like yours, when they were young, they looked in something called the Big Soviet Encyclopedia. Yes. And you look under homosexuality mm -hmm. and it says three things. It's a crime, it's a sickness, and it's a perversion from the West. Yes. That uh, he was older than myself. Mm -hmm. So in that time we had big uh, encyclopedia, but we even didn't think to go to that. Mm -hmm. So because, but we were lucky. In 1996, the Soros Foundation came to our small town and they conducted sex education. Mm -hmm. It was a proliferated time for the Russian government, for Russia itself in the 90s. We were so into the westernization mm -hmm. and uh, being a part of the global uh, changes and um, in 1996 we had that six months of sex education and that first time I heard that there is different couples and some of them homosexuals and it occurred to me that something was there different of course mm -hmm. but the attitude towards LGBTQ people even from my relatives uh, will be very hostile mm -hmm. not because they by default homophobes but because they didn't know during the Soviet reign that uh, the people existed mm -hmm. so that's why uh, I was lucky when I turned 14 and we went to the resort area, Sochi area, and first time I was attracted to any male's bodies and you don't know uh, what to do, but I got home, it was cable TV. <laughs> cable TV Tuesdays, <laughs> Thursdays and Saturdays from 9 to 12. And I watched the first uh, American movies about queer uh, conducts and whatever, like Trick or Oscar Wilde. So that's so many what helped me to go through the identification crisis. Because uh, that's, at the same time, my attitude as my mother's and grandma, we're so non-conforming, we never care about what society does tell about, or does say about us. That's why I just like, okay, I'm gay, and uh, you deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> and I came out, and I came out at my prom. Yeah, but the same, because my mom is very tough, but I, tougher than her she could not handle myself <laughs> so the only person she could not handle it's me so that's uh, what is the attitude and that's what helped me survive because in that hostile when you uh, have a lot of bullying in school so you don't realize children in 90s in Russia they will call you F word not even referring to your identity because they didn't know but your mannerism your gesturing your uh, perception, your posture, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but somehow I managed through, and I was 17 when I left. Did you, um, when you left in, in 2015, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14 uh, you left behind your family? I mm -hmm. assume was that painful? Are you able to keep in touch with them? So that's another story because uh, you didn't have much time to think if you're living forever or not. So on the back of your mind, yes, you understand that you won't be able probably. And that's my attitude because I've been living by myself since 17. So when I moved from my mother to another town, so it was already established. And when I got here uh, and I started meeting people, and some people who came here in 1989 with Jewish immigration, we more lucky because we have Skypes, we have FaceTimes, we have everything to keep uh, communication with our uh, relatives. But I do realize, and that's happening already, that uh, some of my relatives will be dying and I never will see them again. And there is a, you put 
something on the scale, what you, pr what you choose. And you have to choose immigration, you have no any other options so to cope with that. And some of our guys, they cannot, and they're very attached to. Of course, it doesn't mean that I'm not attached to my mother, because I have only my mother. But you realize that I'm not a child anymore. And uh, she probably, on the back of her mind, happier that I'm... Did she know you were going to leave? So she knew, but she didn't know their uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. Of course she knew, when I came out to her when I was 17. But at the same time, I guess mothers are always mothers. Parents are always parents. They, uh, once in a while she will ask if maybe it will be better if you stay there and something like that. Because it's just mother's instinct. Not because she is against that. But uh, I'm losing my family. My, my, they are over 65 right now. So some of them over 70s. One of my uncles died recently. So it's, you know, the matter of life. And, that's not Catholic tradition, and I'm atheist, to be honest with you. So we cope with deaths easily, uh, or with the uh, people leaving us, because we were used to that in the very hardship of the conditions of living in the Soviet Union or uh, in the post-Soviet. So that's kind of egocentric, but in a positive way. So I, I think a lot of people here are generally aware that Putin has not been Putin's regime has not been kind for LGBTQ people, but I want to, but I want to sort of back up from that and, and talk first about even pre-Putin, Russia is a very traditional society, a very traditional culture, with a lot of influence from the Russian Orthodox Church. I am assuming so. Even before Putin, basic attitudes were were homophobic. Is that right? It was a that's a misconception about oh. the Russian political history. That's what my class hear about actually yeah. Russian queer politics. There was a, a, a TV anchor on, in the movie who uh, said, was, was asked what's it like to be gay in Russia and he, he used one word. He said humiliating. You know that so talk about yeah. pre Putin just, so, yeah. just the, the nature of Russian culture uh, the influence of the church and so forth, what that has, how that has formed attitudes about sexual minorities. I apologize if you get me wrong, capitalist people, but I want to say only <laughs> one thing about the Russian history that uh, Russia had been one of the more tolerant countries, historically speaking, because we didn't have any statutes, any penal codes penalizing sodomy or same sex relationship as Western. Uh, countries had before Stalin came to power. Never ever gay people were persecuted under the Russian Empire regime, only was in the military once. But they abolished that because they realized there is no way to, uh, to fix or to handle that uh, same-sex relationship in the military. So when the Europe and West was persecuting, uh, putting on stakes a lot of LG LGBTQ people. Russia did not have that. Mm -hmm. Stalin created, not Stalin, his Politburo and political uh, allies created the enemy as an opposition to the West. Mm -hmm. So they idealized LGBTQ mm -hmm. people, but they used that tool not against gay people, but against political dissidents. Mm -hmm. Because it was easier for, uh, for the government to say, oh, that person engaged with a homosexuality, which was equal to fascism mm -hmm. by the writer Gorky in 1934. So rather than to explain why they persecute them, because they were against Stalin. Mm -hmm. So and of course the Soviet system, the Soviet uh, prison system, penitentiary system, brought a lot of shame and a lot of shadows on LGBTIQ. But uh, frantically speaking, Russia never been traditional country. If you read a lot of sources, Russian people always had fun of their lives in sexual terms. They were not Puritans, like America still. They were not religious much. Can you imagine Orthodox Church? It's only in the middle of the country. Other than that, pagan culture of cultures of Siberia, two-spirit people, gender non-binary, non-conforming people in Siberian tribes, or in the South, people did not care. They just uh, went along because at that time it was agriculture they had to take care of their fields. So, but uh, when the Soviet collapsed, of mm -hmm. course, Yeltsin was persuading that idea that we have to become a part of the global community. Mm -hmm. And he abolished the Article 121, which was sodomy. And in the 90s, it was already kind of growing tolerance towards, and mm -hmm. church did not, at that time, did not have an influence on Russian society. Mm -hmm. People drank, 
people went to work and people didn't care because they 74 years they were living under uh, atheistic mm -hmm. attitudes yeah. so and that's why we already got so much exposure and Americans came a lot of products a lot of movies mm -hmm. and people already okay there is some people gave okay let them leave mm -hmm. so uh, and in 90s it was opposite than Putin doing right now so we try to portray ourselves that we uh, deserve to be accept to G7 we started being G8 mm -hmm. you know like an appendix to G7 mm -hmm. so and uh, that was requiring to uh, implement human rights concept mm -hmm. so uh, of course not everywhere it's in the big cities when you live in, in the small town the changes never get you on time mm -hmm. you're always behind you always you're lucky here in Bloomington because you have a campus but it's usually very behind mm -hmm. And that's why, of course, people, but generally speaking, even from my experience, uh, talking to people on the street, they're not homophobic, they're okay. That homophobia is created by the intellectuals, by intelligence and by ideologists which surround it. So homophobia, which is intellectual, is more dangerous than the homophobia on the streets. <laughs> which we think of in this country as the opposite. We think well, the intellectuals are the most liberal, the most tolerant, the most progressive, and it's, you know, the, the, the sort of average person in a small town that has sort of conservative backward attitudes. But there is an excuse because people in small towns and communities, they have never been exposed to different culture. Mm -hmm. And it's our role and strategy to educate them if they are willing. Mm -hmm. But when people from the intellectual side, from the politician side, tell about that we support traditional values and religious values, that's more dangerous than people on the street who probably will change their mind if you talk to them. Mm -hmm. So in Russia it's the same, the same. So before Putin took over and before he started doing this anti-LGBTIQ campaign mm -hmm. since 2008, so people generally speaking uh, were used to gay mm. people and LGBTQ people, not transgender people mm. because there was no any discussion about that. Mm -hmm. But if you turn on TV in the 90s, pop culture, that one of my classes here, we uh, watched uh, Russian uh, music videos. Mm -hmm. And if you look at 90s, it was more progressive than American ones. <laughs> so queer, so queer at any level. And people loved it, babushkas will go to the concerts and will dance. <laughs> so that was totally uh, the attitude of the Russians. And Russians, uh, I cannot generalize, of mm -hmm. course, yeah. and it, everybody has different experiences. But the Soviet Union falls, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, the country's opening up, yeah. there's this liberation, and then comes Putin. And then he comes the rain again, right? Mm -hmm. So Putin comes, and at, at the beginning he was... Putin comes into power, what year? 1999. 1999. 1999, he was appointed as prime minister, and that was already a succession of power. So mm -hmm. Yeltsin was looking for a successor because he, his health declined and he was under surgeries many times, and he understood to carry on reforms, he needed some successor. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake which oligarch, uh, oligarchs made mm -hmm. when they found Putin. Putin was a... KGB agent, Putin was a director of Federal Security Service, mm -hmm. my beloved one. So, and, but why Yeltsin, not even Yeltsin, but his surroundings pointed at him because Putin was very loyal to the people who uh, welcomed him to power. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what they was understanding, that Putin will carry on the ideas. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake. And at the beginning, Putin did not changed the surface of country pretty much in terms of human rights and LGBT and he was so dedicated to be a garant of constitution he will uh, say Angela Merkel will always pro human rights because he needed to win the people's uh, souls and hearts and sometimes even not mind I'm not saying mind so and Russians did not vote for him Russians voted for the choice which Yeltsin made for them, mm -hmm. because Yeltsin was very beloved by Russians. Mm -hmm. And that's how Putin came to power, accidentally, mm -hmm. an accidental leader. And that, of course, in, you can understand the mindset of the person who served under the secret police. It will not be a democratic leader at all. It will be absolutely very narrow mindset, and in order to keep power, he needed to uh, welcome military services mm -hmm. and uh, surround himself by the loyal people. Mm -hmm. And the loyal people who 
he invited were from KGB. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know, the whole idea and uh, when they realized by uh, 2005, 2006, 7 that Putin's popularity declined, mm -hmm. they needed to find the enemy, the scapegoat. And that became queer people? Not uh, right away. The first it was oligarchs. Mm -hmm. They uh, eliminated oligarchs, but grew more oligarchs uh, I around. The oligarchs are Putin, Putin's buddies. I yes, think. but he did, does not consider them oligarchs. They're fair people. <laughs> They're very, you know. Uh, he eliminated oligarchs, free press. Mm -hmm. So all journalists killed almost the uh, journalists who investigated Putin and scandals. Governors who were independent, they all uh, lay dead right now. So first he was eliminating the political enemies. And after that, when he realized that something should be because the ideology does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. It only leaves free generation and there was no ideology. Mm -hmm. And that what they came up with the idea of spiritual staples. Mm -hmm. So because in 2008, it was very convenient for him because the old patriarch, the head of the church, died. So the Russian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church. Orthodox church it's right on time, he died. He was very, he was okay, he was, nobody, took him seriously. Mm -hmm. And that Putin's chance to uh, get someone who will carry on the idea of traditional staples or traditional mm -hmm. spirit. And he invites Kirill, who was KGB agent during the 80s. He was, uh, he was covering pedophilia scandals. So something reminds me Catholic Church right now. So that was a lot of, and he was already a part of the system. Mm -hmm. And that guy comes and he starts spreading his absolutely poisonous rhetoric. So a, lo a lot of uh, enemies around the country. And of course, we live in scene, says the person who was one of the richest people in the world, the head of the Ru uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And they started doing these scary things. They started scaring parents. <gasps> Everywhere pedophiles. You go somewhere pedophiles at the corner, they wait for your child to get seduced. And they started spreading the venom via uh, traditional channels because Russia has only government controlled mm -hmm. media right now. No, but why is this? It, it sounds like these are sophisticated enough people. He really, in some sense, doesn't believe this. This isn't, this isn't ignorance. This is some strategic scapegoat mm -hmm. it sounds like why spread the fear of pedophilia which then leads to so the fear LGBT. Of queer people what is the underlying motive for that because he couldn't choose any others he could not blame on jews as it was in soviet union it will not work he will be kicked out of the right away mm -hmm. even though anti-semitism still exists in russia but he could mm -hmm. not he could not uh place the beat on uh chechen people because mm -hmm. chechen government was under control and they were loyal dogs of Putin, he could not blame somebody else. And that comes the intertwined scapegoat. Who shall we blame? Okay, there's the United States, the old enemy, the kind of the cave of mm -hmm. all sins and all misdeeds mm -hmm. and all untraditional behavior. Mm -hmm. And there's one group of people who has not been established in people's mind. It still was very shaky position of LGBTQ mm -hmm. people. That's why they started not with the LGBTQ people, but with pedophilia, mm -hmm. just to test the water. Mm -hmm. And it worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. So when they, every single day, you will turn on TV 2010, and there's all TV programs, pedophilia, pedophilia, pedophilia. There is a group of pedophiles they found uh, in the cave and they were raping the four-year-old boy. And all this that talk about boys. Mm -hmm. Never they consider pedophilia as a link to um, absolute all genders, mm -hmm. regardless. And it's so many things and eventually they uh, got the very good re good reason, mm -hmm. the uh, Dima Yakovlev law. And if you remember, the Magnitsky was killed in the uh, cell and Congress passed the local Magnitsky Act prohibiting some diplomats and uh, officials to come to the United States. What Russia does? They found the American family when the one Russian adopted child, Dima Yakovlev, was killed mm -hmm. or died in the foster care of the Americans. And that was the perfect uh, tool to start promoting that idea. Oh, you see, we have to uh, pass the Dima Yakovlev law, which will say that Americans are not allowed to adopt our children because they sexually abuse our children. And after that, they say same-sex marriages or same-sex couples cannot because they use, they, uh, and they start, so it's four or five years of campaign of hate 
on TV. And eventually in 2011, they passed that law called pedophilia law, which means uh, if you're involved with heterosexual pedophilia, it's uh, until 14, you mm -hmm. turn 14. After 14, heterosexual relationship allowed. Mm -hmm. Homosexual pedophilia, uh, till 16. And we were forced, every single person worked for public education to go every single summer to police prison to obtain a record that you never been convicted in pedophilia. Mm -hmm. So professors who never had any deal with children, as I already mentioned. So it's been, and all of a sudden they realize, okay, people eat it. Mm -hmm. People absorb that information. And some parents started organizing parents club, parents troops. They started going out on the streets to look for pedophiles equals LGBTQ, gay males. So the, so the, the Russian Orthodox Church is doing Putin's bidding, but still, I mean, there is some reason why you need to create an enemy, an other. Why is that? Is it because Putin himself risks being unpopular or the economy is not doing well and so you create an enemy that you can use to distract and blame? As it always works with Russian people and the Soviet people, so you have to find someone to blame on your economical decline because in 2008 it was as worldwide uh, the crisis, the huge crisis hit Russia as well. But in order to uh, distract people's attention from political crisis, because there was talks about some, and in 2011 it was a huge Balotne Square, Balotne Ploshit protest in Moscow, and of course they needed to find that scapegoat which would kind of explain why we should do that. And Russian people, so in uh, Soviet time, they believed Communist Party. The Russian people, they do not like to think. Nationwide mentality of us is to be led by someone. We will blame God on something. And God who uh, caused us this car accident, God, or our neighbors. We always have to blame someone. We are not guilty ourselves. That's why Putin totally uh, counted on that. And that was a, a, the huge intertwine of different, different categories of enemies, right? So, and he said, you see, and the patriarch, the head of the church, comes out like, you see why we live like that? And we don't want to live like in Europe. Europe is dying because they have 50, 52 genders. They have a parent one and parent two. And that was uh, in the Russian mind, people not critically thinking about anything. And like, they look like zombies at that screen and they like Fox News, something like that. So they look at that and they start believing, even though smart people, which was absolutely a revelation for me from my relative side who never were religious, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden say, we have to go to church to lead the candle for whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that was a very interesting uh, change. So Communist Party dies, so we need another hero, and that will, will be the church. And Putin represents the God appointed leader. Mm -hmm. So it was a tradition with the Russian Tsar. Mm -hmm. So Russian Tsar is kind of sent by gods, by God, mm -hmm. to the uh, Russia to save us. Mm -hmm. So he was presented as savior. Mm -hmm. And that's how all comes together. And unfortunately, they started just hitting. Mm -hmm. And they, if you turn on TV, the first channel, the 9 p.m. news, they will look what is going on in Europe and they show the pride. But pride not like with all of these colors, but pride with BDSM people who always like on this, in this leather. And can you imagine 80 year old uh, babushka sitting in front of the camera and say, oh, that's the scene. Mm, that's what it means to that's be gay. That's what it means to be gay. Yeah. That's so, what it means to so be gay. So you talked about what your experience was like as a professor. How bad is it for the average gay or lesbian person in, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in a smaller city? What is life like? I mean, again, watching the movie, mm -hmm. um, it, it sounds like America in the 1960s. Uh, you know, uh, two oh, men, it's, two it's men, a live, two men you know? live together. It's uh, oh, this is my friend. You know, my, mm -hmm. my roommate. Um, you, you can't talk publicly. Um, you are bashed. You are beaten. So, what what is the reality of being queer in Russia today for yeah. the average? for the average, I, I, I would say transgender, but you said transge transgender, is, 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 that is a phenomenon that almost still isn't yeah. understood or doesn't exist. Um, but, but for the average gay, lesbian, or, or trans, or intersex person, what is life like? 
So people again forced to ba back to closet. So we never been out too much. So it was very slow process for people to come out, to express themselves and other circumstances when they watch the news and they watch the YouTube videos with all of these hauntings. Of course, the only thing people start doing, they uh, to, uh, dismiss the sexuality and identity. They go back to closets because they know they could face the physical abuse, they could face the moral abuse, the hate speech, and they could be fired. And average LGBTQ person now, uh, as well as other others, mm -hmm. they are not safe at all in Russia. And uh, by today, already it has gotten to the point of absolutely unbearable circumstances. So even 2013-14, it was public people like myself and some other people uh, and uh, regular people who attend disco bars or gay bars on the ground, they would say, oh, it doesn't affect us. We are living together, we are living quietly, we are brother, sister, as mm -hmm. you say, so we use that all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but by now, no, nobody is safe because we already know that Chechnya is happening, the genocide of queer people in Chechnya. We know that uh, Occupy Pedophilia uh, planted new seeds and uh, the new movement uh, organized called the So uh, Pila. So they hunt people and a couple of them already got killed and some of them were decapitated. So it, it's all on YouTube it's, and people start seeing that and there is like two strategies even three strategies. One strategy to live, if you're able to, and uh, since 2013, the enormous amount of people left Russia and spread throughout the world, and mostly Europe or the United States. Uh, the second, if you prefer to keep quiet, to keep low profile, and you live with someone and you have money to have the more like luxurious mm -hmm. life and to pretend. And the third one, to become an oppressor yourself. So that's another story when LGBTQ people report on their own kind in order to survive, which is mistake because they know, probably they don't realize, but at the end of the day, they will be punished as well. So that's a three strategies, unfortunately, what I observe, but it's very dangerous. It's very uh, all uh, dating profiles now, uh, and there is a fake uh, dating sites, and if you set up a date and will 20 people show up and beat you up, uh, or the Cossacks, all these Russian traditional uh, social category, they go to the bars and they start gay bashing. So there's so many things. And what is very peculiar that they, the people who attack gay people or queer people, they're not penalized. If three years ago, five years ago, there will be still kind of fear. Mm -hmm. What if we attack someone and we're gonna get punished? But they've seen throughout the years, there is no punishment for that. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, justification of killing of LGBTQ people. I, I, think, I, I think I saw you say in a video that a police officer will say, I know who beat you up, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna do anything. That's about. what I was told when I was beaten up severely in 2004 and was, uh, already alarming when he told me, I know uh, who beat you up, and he said to so many perverts in my district, so basically you have to blame yourself. Uh, and that's what I realized, that police never will be on your side, and we know that a couple of the movements like Occupy Pedophilia are sponsored by the police. So that's a kind of secret force of the police to uh, get rid of those undesirable elements. Or police tell you, you have to keep quiet. But how many police officers are LGBTQ? Mm -hmm. And how many of them involved in attacking LGBTQ people? So there's so many things, uh, and I cannot imagine, because I've been working with asylum seekers besides myself for five years, and stories that I hear beyond. Mm -hmm. You cannot believe, and when you sit with them and converse with them, you think that you're somewhere in surreality. So it's not happening, it's just like a fiction. Are there, are there differences by age? So in other words, I you know, experience this myself and I've, I've watched this in this country, the phenomenon that you know, the younger you, and, and back in the 90s when I was going to political science conferences and talking about this, you know, the younger you are, the more supportive you are, the more comfortable you are with gay people, generational replacement will take care of this. Um, our friend Ken Sherrill, you know, mm -hmm. said, you know, well, the Grim Reaper gets, you know, three or four, is responsible for three or four percent a year and kind of the increase in mm -hmm. the number of people who are tolerant toward gay people. Is that, is it possible for that to happen in Russia? Or are, is the teaching and the repression 
so stifling that even people in their teens and 20s are their attitudes just as homophobic, just as bad as people in their 50s, 60s, 70s? Will this change as an older generation dies off? That's hard to predict because uh, there is different layers to that. So some older people more tolerant than younger people, and which I know personally, they like over 50, 40, in their 40s because they lived through 90s mm -hmm. and they had that kind of experience. And some, and you have to understand that the generation which is now 20 years old, they lived only under Putin. They were born in the Putin's regime, and they live under Putin, and they still under Putin. Mm -hmm. So, and there is like a, but they still exposed to social media. So now it's a global human being, right? So they already can go and see other phenomena if they live in the biggest towns, on biggest cities. Uh, on the larger scale, I would say that we've seen the uh, like percentage of tolerance. Uh, growing and increasing in 2000s and even the older generation because they generally more intelligent they generally even it will be uh, very bizarre but they were uh, raised by the Soviet system and Soviet education system was not uh, intolerant in terms of like, you know, there was still mm -hmm. some kind of values and belief in the brighter future and be kind to your uh, mm -hmm. comrade, whatever. Mm -hmm. So they could have absorbed, but at the same time, uh, I cannot say because the Putin has affected a lot of minds and unfortunately people would remain, even though they think differently, but because of the fear of, of think differently, they're gonna keep silent, and they uh, probably accept their children in their families, and that I know for a fact. But they never would go and advocate for their children uh, in the public or uh, between the among their neighbors. So it's a very hard prediction. So, but of course, people say, "What if Putin dies?" Putin dies, but population goes on, and even Putin or without Putin. It's already damaged the whole politics towards LGBTQ people. In order to recover, we will need 20, 30, 50 years mm -hmm. to get to the scale to be more progressive and to be more active. So, but then, uh, if we go to New York and to Brighton Beach area, Russian-speaking population which left the Soviet Union in the 70s, they're homophobic as hell. That's what I, I wanted. To, <laughs> before we throw it open to questions, that's I wanted to spend just one or two. Mm -hmm. Uh, more minutes talking about your experience here. So you, did you consciously choose to settle in Brighton Beach, a neighborhood of Brooklyn, because of that? Or did you settle there and then realize that it's very homophobic? So you have done, you've had your work cut out for you, working with this Russian immigrant community. In oh, believe Brooklyn. it was not my choice. I, at that time, I didn't even know where I was settling down in because it was Midwood. And when at first you go there, you don't see anything, and all of a sudden you realize there is a kind of appendix to the Republic of Brighton Beach. Mm -hmm. And when you start encountering homophobia, and when I met a lot of people, they will live there and will tell me, there's so many homophobia here. We still are not open. We still keep quiet because we're afraid to be kicked out of our houses or be fired from jobs. And I heard so many times. So how Russians usually operate, you go on the Q train. If you've ever been to New York, Q train goes from Queens to uh, uh, Brighton Beach. So there is a, you can say the population changes. By Church Avenue, there already Russian people remain. And Russian people who do not speak most English, they would curse everyone on the train. The black person who does wear certain shoes, they will speak in Russian. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that situation because they assume that I didn't speak Russian and they will tell right to my face F word. And they will think that nobody understands them. Mm -hmm. So, and after that, of course, I've encountered and a lot of- And you reply in Russian, they must be very surprised. So I never reveal, that's what uh, my story, I never speak to them in mm -hmm. Russian. In my neighborhood, I mm -hmm. never speak in Russian. So I go to the Russian store because there is only candies you can get. <laughs> but they look at you and they suspect that probably you are not the person you try to be. Mm -hmm. And they know that you speak Russian but, and they're so hostile, they will even throw meat at you. So I, I, I add so many things. But on a larger scale, some people got beaten up there. Some people got uh, expelled, some people, and 
I had one client and I had to call to mental health services to connect him because he was HIV positive and I call that uh, Russian, it's called Jewish board, that's the Russian division and the person who is on the other side of the phone, uh, she asked me, I say, I say that HIV person, he's gay and she says he is repaired because in Russian like peridelony, mm -hmm. remade, so in their mind it's something not normal, mm -hmm. it's something abnormal. And so many things, and the problem is the government has not been reacting on that. Mm -hmm. Because the mayor goes there and he speaks their language because he needs a constituency, he needs mm -hmm. votes. He never raised any issues with homophobia. You go to the police, police like, we never... Still to Blasi, oh, mayor of New York. Oh, okay. So we're talking about <laughs> Brooklyn, one of the hippest places in this country, uh, right uh, in the middle uh, of that. No. It's downtown Bushwick, yes, uh, uh, Williamsburg hipsters. That's like more expensive than Manhattan right now. Believe me, hipsters are not the hipsters in the 1920s. Hipsters are the rich kids who can afford to live in the most gentrified areas of New York. So we not from there. The south of Brooklyn totally cut. So the Brighton Beach is isolated. So you will be surprised. I haven't seen like that since my Soviet childhood. The attitudes how they scream at each other, how they argue, I'm Moscow Jew, I'm Odessa Jew, so they have rivalry. And they, there is no uh, diversity at all. So uh, I've been talking to African-American people who live in Coney Island, they're afraid to go to the Russian area because they get discriminated right away. So and uh, with this conspiracy of silence, as they call it, no place to LGBTIQ. And when we start, started doing something publicly, they got so pissed at us. And they started campaigning again against me and last year I got so many death threats from the Brighton Beach community because of Brighton Beach pride because I um, uh, argued with one person who was very racist and I just denounced that uh, on my Facebook oh that was so many things and she says in the Russian way 90s I have my brothers or bros mm -hmm. my mafia they will come to you and they will take care of you that's an attitude in Brighton Beach. Mm -hmm. That sounds as bad as what you left behind. Oh, in, in, in some cases, even worse. Mm -hmm. But now what we've done with Brighton Beach Pride, uh, at least they cannot speak openly about that. So they pissed, they're angry, mm -hmm. but that already is something starting to move. Mm -hmm. So we uh, expose the homophobia. And the government right now already, okay, if you, because I'm very annoying, I go to the government, I go to the agency, and I tell them, you're not right, we have to get protection. And they're like, you know, they've, it's very corrupt government. New York City is not so progressive as you would think. And then you came to the nirvana of Bloomington. So oh, you it was having a good eight weeks. Yes, for me, actually, yeah. So when I was going here, and people, where, India? Pants and you know all of these associations. <laughs> it's not here anymore. It, yeah, but it doesn't matter because for me that's what I'm trying to tell a lot of people. So you have so much preconceptions about New York. New York uh, is not better than any other state. Mm -hmm. It's better in some ways, but if everybody goes to New York, what is going to be with other country towns or uh, country place? Who is going to fight for that? Mm -hmm. So for me, I move into a very small town yeah. with like where. 60% of Trump supporters No, I have, I'm energized because I have something to fight with. So, uh, and that's why I, here, you know, that's so, it's about people. It's about your intentions and desires. So that's why I'm glad to move from New York because New York is a very hypocritical place. When people do not care about the LGBT community is so divided, it's all about white, gay, male, population, mm -hmm. no transgender people of color, mm -hmm. no uh, contradictions towards uh, police brutality, which mm -hmm. still happens towards uh, transgender people, mm -hmm. no intersex visibility. Mm -hmm. So it's all about money. Yeah. You go to different uh, United Nations and you are sick of them because they tell you something and never do anything. So that's why I'm counting on grassroots. I'm counting on people and here I found the very interesting communities, like in Spencer Pride Center, which mm -hmm. I went to, it's yep. an amazing role model mm -hmm. for most uh, small towns which we should promote. That's why we're trying to increase that visibility and I'm helping them right now with the uh, publicity because that's what I appreciate. Yeah. So let me ask you guys if you have questions for Leosha. You, you must, you must have something that would be provoked by that fascinating story, set of stories. Do not be shy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about like I, I know Professor Sanford asked you about um, uh -huh. what um, 
like daily life is like for being gay, but like I think about like for me as a gay man in Indiana, what's dating life like for a young gay guy in Russia, right? Because I know what it's like to date here and it's very app centered um, and online dating centered for a lot of, I think, young gay guys. But what, what's it like in Russia? What is what is that? Like? And, and I, I should mention, just out of fairness, we, we're videotaping this for you for the Mauer YouTube yeah. site. So, so just so you know, okay, it's all good. Okay, yeah. that's a good question. So, in uh, cities like my city of firm, it's very, it's not secured. So, in uh, 2000, it was a special places that we call cruising spots. We will meet uh -huh. each other on the benches by the theater, and we knew it was designated to us. Now, of course, in the uh, era of social media, people will meet through, but with all of this uh, hostility and hunt, gay hunting and traps, people more and more afraid to go online and to mention because they've been uh, discriminated or trapped or beaten up. So it's very dangerous, and I know that there are so many problems with that, and people who... That's another story, unfortunate story for LGBTIQ community in Russia. If you meet someone, and you have no passion towards each other, but you remain together because it's only one way, and you think in the narrow uh, mindset that probably you never will meet anyone else. And that's a lot of stories involving substance abuse, uh, domestic violence, so there's, it's not the securest. The people who have access to money, they go usually somewhere, and the romantic relationship, as you know, the Soviet Union would say, we didn't have sex, we had love. So that not, does not exist anymore, and it's very dangerous. Especially if you are from Republic of Chechnya or Caucasus, where Muslim region, traditional regions, they even cannot go on dating apps because it's tracked by the government and they have to go to neighboring regions to have some sexual encounter, but no couples, nothing. It's very, it's so bizarre right now, but I've known couples who've been living together for many years because of that. It's like here, I guess, pre-stone wall or post-stone wall era of dating, mm -hmm. right? So people who met probably 40 years ago, they're still together because it's kind of uh, habit. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not, uh, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, you could find, but farther up, especially to Siberia, forget about that, it's very dangerous. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it seems like a lot of this your experience in this stuff we've been talking about is centered around sort of um, um, men and sort of the gay community. Is it, I wouldn't say easier, but is the experience for um, like women, lesbians, more bi, etc., etc., is it, are they able to fly more under the radar? Is there less open brutality towards them? Um, just anything you can speak towards them? Yes, yeah, that's a good question for lesbian. Uh, community for women in general it's I, I never will say easier I will say it's different because women are still consider in Russia it's fertile they can give birth it's a very traditional approach and the women easier to live together as it's been throughout history so we are friends we raise children together so people uh, generally more tolerant towards that because they do not care it's always about the gay males who are kind of you know depiction of that depravity of masculinity and patriarchy but generally speaking Russia has been very feminine country and uh, in social politics it's always dominance of women rather than men it's in political course but uh, in the family as I always say we've been raised by same-sex couples my grandmother and my mother so it's been the whole <laughs> story of that and <clears throat> For transgender people, it's more uh, difficult because there is no uh, access to any care. It's only underground clinics. There is uh, no IDs for them uh, and hostility towards them, much, much especially uh, M to F transgender people. So they beaten up, they killed, they're not investigated. It's a very brutal. Uh, to intersex people, intersex people, they kind of. Uh, on a different scale because they still consider it as a genetic disease or genetic pa pathology which Russians usually more tolerant to because in our concept it's that we have to help them it's not their fault it's biology so that's uh, generally speaking but uh, with people been I've been together uh, with lesbian uh, couples so nobody safe right now so, but if you look at immigration it will be more gay males. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. 
Um, I know that like in the United States, especially in the 80s and 90s, there was like a huge outbreak of HIV and AIDS. Um, so if those men in Russia were to like um, seek treatment, how were they kind of treated or were they like punished for that? It's it's a good what question. is the status of, of HIV? That's a great question. Russia. So, uh, in 2016, the government shut down all HIV-related programs. Since 2016, the government has not released any data on HIV, and now we are at the point that 1.2 million people affected with HIV, most of them uh, substance abusers. Uh, but uh, in the 80s, it was a preconception that the uh, catalyst of HIV are LGBTQ people. So now we have a double stigmatization, and since 2016, gay males affected uh, by HIV started coming to the United States, and uh, first, they cannot find any treatment because there is no medication at all because of sanctions. The Congress imposed sanctions. It means that we don't have an access to uh, some kind of quality medication, and if we have, it's stuffed with calcium. So if you're a friendly doctor, you will love to give your gay patient uh, medication, but you don't have it. The second, it's an attitude, because the whole anti-LGBT IQ stances, the people who will seek that treatment, they will be said, uh, told, and some of my friends were told, you are F, you have to go and die because it's your fault. Even though the 0.1% uh, of HIV population is LGBT IQ. So, but it's easy to blame on, and of course, uh, unfortunately, because lack of sex education, lack of uh, needle exchange programs in Russia, but uh, people again blame on LGBTQ, and uh, they, I already know some stories and some incidents when people died from AIDS in 2018. We are in 2018, and people dying from AIDS uh, in the contemporary world. So it's very hard, and especially in Russia, you cannot access treatment if you are not from this particular city. So imagine you live in Moscow, but you don't have residency of Moscow. So they will send you to some kind of rural HIV center, which does not exist. Uh, or you have to bribe someone to get that particular paper. And if you go there, there is no treatment. So that's so much involved. And unfortunately, now I have noticed more and more hostility towards LGBTQ as HIV affected people. So that's very unfortunate and since 2016 we've got over 50 people who came personally to me. I connected them and it's the same in, in the United States. If you're familiar with that only New York has programs for HIV people with housing, with medication. We observe now the internal migration from Georgia, from some uh, Middle West, Midwest states. So it's, it's very unfortunate, yeah. Is there any um International code allowed? Maybe some kind of, you know, international. Mm -hmm. There is the Elton John Fund Foundation, which helped has helped a lot. There is a certain groups in Russia, which located mostly in Moscow and Saint Petersburg. They called AIDS Center, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, it's called Parni Plus, Voice Plus. So they have some. Uh, they receive condoms, they receive programming, but it's difficult for them to obtain medication because under sanctions it will be a black market. So, but uh, after the foreign agents law, which passed in 2013, a lot of organizations who have been helping uh, considered and people do not want to go to Russia. They do not want to invest. But they try to smuggle, and I know that they uh, smuggle from Germany, from France, some very expensive medication, but it's so limited, it will be only to a little amount, a little number of people, yeah. Can people go and get treatment in the West or other countries? If you are very rich, rich. so it will cost you approximately $2,000 a month, considered in Russian salary average is $200 mm -hmm. a month. So if you're an HIV person with no income, whatsoever you cannot obtain. But you can get, and now I guess the even shipping and uh, on the border uh, is checked by the patrol of Russia. So it could be, actually the book of Masha Gessen has been uh, detained on the border because one guy ordered through Amazon <laughs> and uh, he was complaining why it's not coming and R Russia sent it on expertise, linguistic expertise on the uh, extremist language and something like that. So what we talk about medication. Yeah. Brett. Uh, 
Um, so obviously all of us here are getting our education at IU to go change the world, hopefully. What can we do as American citizens and as um, citizens of the world, if you will, um, to help the plight of LGBTQ people in Russia? So that's a good question. I get that question all the time. And uh, what I appreciate, because I'm on the very skeptical side, and before uh, 2016, I thought, oh, young people, so lazy. They always like about hipstering stuff. But November 2016 changed the millennials drastically, and people started getting involved with the activists. And when uh, they ask, the only thing what I could suggest to you, so if you're interested in helping, uh, you have to uh, consider what cause you want to help too. So we have a lot of organizations, uh, even in Russia right now, the like Russian LGBT network. You can donate, you can uh, spread the word, you can share some news. So small things are not small. They always change something. And we launched the group called Voices for, which in 2017 came to me, and we've been trying to raise awareness about genocide in Chechnya and about LGBTIQ rights in Russia via different platforms because even if you do it here all of a sudden Americans realize that oh why before they will ask why Russians come to the United States why Russian gays come to the United States they should be living not so bad in Russia so even with that so they're all you can um, help as a volunteer in your local immigration resettlement center which Indianapolis has I believe so there is so many things you can and you can always help through LGBT in terms of volunteering or any cause because we, we've been trying to we don't have our branch if you will in Indianapolis but who knows there's a huge population right now of uh, people interested in Russian speaking affairs that, that's what I will or of course, try to, now I guess it's a campaign, and it's political campaign, it's voting, because it affects all layers, or if the bills, uh, anti-immigrant bills introduced, you have to campaign, you have to raise it, we have to call your local uh, officials or uh, Congress people. So that's a lot of things to do, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So you are on your way to Slippery Rock? I am. My guess is that Slippery Rock does not know what it's about to be hit with. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. But it will be very interesting to move from New York and to do something absolutely. So you'll be head of the LGBT center. They're it's two centers. University? It's a Pride Center and Women's Center okay. of the University. Yes. So okay. they combine together. It's very challenging, but it's very. They. I would say it's very progressive. So nobody heard probably about Slippery Rock, but you know. There are so many things, and they consider one of the safest campuses in the United States. And so, and dining hall is one of the best. And we get to teach also. So I don't know if I'm going to teach. So I, it's my idea. Before, when I came to the United States, I wanted to continue teaching. Now, when I've been involved with activism, I realized I cannot only teach. Because, uh, do not get me wrong, what I found in academia a lot, that's the Ivory Tower Academia, and sometimes uh, academia does not see the real things outside the tower. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I see myself, to combine the practical experience and teaching in two, because uh, it's more interesting to be on the both well, we are event. really fortunate to have had you here for eight weeks. So, Thank you. And, and I am fortunate to be here and that you invited me. Yeah. And so let's get it. <laughs>